This is section eight of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter Four Sailor Life in the American Service. Read by John Greenman. When the crew of the United States first boarded our frigate to take possession of her and their prize, our men, heated with the fury of the battle, exasperated with the sight of their dead and wounded shipmates, and rendered furious by the rum they had obtained from the spirit-room, felt and exhibited some disposition to fight their captors. But after the confusion had subsided, and part of our men were snugly stowed away in the American ship, and the remainder found themselves kindly used in their own, the utmost good feeling began to prevail. We set to work to cleanse the ship, using hot vinegar to take out the scent of the blood that had dyed the white of our planks with crimson. We also aided in fitting our disabled frigate for her voyage. This being accomplished, both ships sailed in company toward the American coast. I soon felt myself perfectly at home with the American seamen, so much so that I chose to mess with them. My shipmates also participated in similar feelings in both ships. All idea that we had been trying to shoot each other so shortly before seemed forgotten. We ate together, drank together, joked, sung, laughed, told yarns. In short, a perfect union of ideas, feelings, and purposes seemed to exist among all hands. A corresponding state of unanimity existed, I was told, among the officers. Our voyage was one of considerable excitement. The seas swarmed with British cruisers, and it was extremely doubtful whether the United States would elude their grasp, and reach the protection of an American port with her prize. I hoped most sincerely to avoid them, as did most of my old shipmates. In this we agreed with our captors, who wisely desired to dispose of one conquest before they attempted another. Our former officers, of course, were anxious for the sight of a British flag, but we saw none and after a prosperous voyage from the scene of conflict, we heard the welcome cry of Land Ho! The United States entered the port of New London, but owing to a sudden shift of the wind, the Macedonian had to lie off and on for several hours. Had an English cruiser found us in this situation, we would have been easily recovered, and as it was extremely probable we should fall in with one, I felt quite uneasy until after several hours we made out to run into the pretty harbor of Newport. We fired a salute as we came to anchor, which was promptly returned by the people on shore. While we lay here a few days, several of our men contrived to run away. I would have done so, too, but for the vigilance of the prize officers, who were ordered to keep us, that we might be exchanged for those Americans who had fallen into British hands. My desire for freedom at length prevailed over prudence, and I made my escape, glad to be rid of the tyranny to which I had been so long exposed. But this step, which, on reflection, I do not commend, brought another evil. I was destitute of any means of support, and after numerous ineffectual efforts to get employment on land, I again took to a seafaring life, this time, however, entering myself on board a United States brig of war, the siren, carrying sixteen guns. I was then in the seventeenth year of my life. I was recommended by acquaintances to ship myself under a false name, but in defiance of my fears I entered under my own proper name of Samuel Leach. My first impressions of the American service were very favorable. The treatment in the siren was more lenient than in the Macedonian. The captain and officers were kind while there was a total exemption from that petty tyranny exercised by the upstart midshipmen in the British service. As a necessary effect, our crew were as comfortable and happy as men ever are in a man of war. Our brig had before this taken in her guns, consisting of two long nine-pounders, twelve twenty-four-pound carronades, and two forty-two-pounders. Our crew was composed of about one hundred and twenty-five smart active men. We were all supplied with stout leathern caps, something like those used by firemen. These were crossed by two strips of iron covered with bearskin, and were designed to defend the head, in boarding an enemy ship, 
from the stroke of the cutlass. Strips of bearskin were likewise used to fasten them on, serving the purpose of false whiskers, and causing us to look as fierce as hungry wolves. We were also frequently exercised in the various evolutions of a sea-fight, first using our cannon, then seizing our cutlasses and boarding-pikes, and cutting to the right and left, as if in the act of boarding an enemy's ship. Thus we spent our time from early in the fall until after Christmas, when we received orders to hold ourselves in readiness for sea. As we lay waiting for our final orders, a report reached us that a large English brig of war called the Nimrod lay in a cove somewhere near Boston Bay. Upon this information our officers planned a night expedition for the purpose of effecting her capture. Our intended mode of attack was to run close alongside, pour a broadside upon her, and then, without further ceremony, board her cutlass in hand. So we took in our powder, ground up our cutlasses, and towards night got under way. A change in the wind, however, defeated our designs, and we put into Salem Harbor, with no other result than the freezing of a man's fingers, which happened while we were furling our sails. Thus ended our first warlike expedition in the Siren. Shortly after this affair, we received orders to start on a cruise to the coast of Africa, and in company with the Grand Turk, a privateer, set sail from Salem. Passing the fort, we received the usual hail from the sentry of, "'Brig ahoy! Where are you bound to?' To this salutation the first lieutenant jocosely answered, "'There and back again, on a man-of-war's cruise!' Such a reply would not have satisfied a British soldier, but we shot past the fort, unmolested. After two days we parted company with the Grand Turk, and by the aid of a fair wind soon found ourselves in the Gulf Stream, where, instead of fearing frozen fingers, we could go barefooted and feel quite comfortable. We now kept a sharp lookout at the masthead, but met with nothing until we reached the Canary Islands, near which we saw a boatload of Portuguese, who, coming alongside, talked in their native tongue with great noise and earnestness, but were no more intelligible to us than so many blackbirds. While off the African coast our captain died. His wasted body was placed in a coffin with shot to sink it. After the service had been read, the plank on which the coffin rested was elevated, and it slipped into the great deep. The yards were braced round, and we were under way again, when, to our surprise and grief, we saw the coffin floating on the waves. The reason was, the carpenter had bored holes in the top and bottom. He should have made them only in the top. After the funeral the crew were called aft, and the first lieutenant, Mr. Nicholson, told us that it should be left to our decision whether he should assume the command and continue the cruise, or return home. We gave him three hearty cheers in token of our wish to continue the cruise. He was a noble-minded man, very kind and civil to his crew, and the opposite in every respect to the haughty, lordly captain with whom I first sailed in the Macedonian. Seeing me one day with rather a poor hat on, he called me aft and presented me with one of his own, but little worn. "'Good luck to him,' said I, in sailor phrase, as I returned to my messmates. We also lost two of our crew, who fell victims to the heat of the climate. One morning the cry of, "'Sail ho!' directed our attention to a strange sail which had hove to, with her courses hauled up. At first we took her for a British man-of-war brig. The hands were summoned to quarters, and the ship got ready for action. A nearer approach, however, convinced us that the supposed enemy was no other than our old friend the Grand Turk. She did not appear to know us, for no sooner did she see that our craft was a brig of war than, supposing us to belong to John Bull, she crowded all her canvas and made the best of her way off. Knowing what she was, we permitted her to escape without further alarm. The first land we made was Cape Mount. The natives came off to a considerable distance in their canoes, clothed in nothing but a piece of cloth fastened round the waist, and extending downward to the feet. As we approached the shore we saw several fires burning. This we were told in the broken English spoken by our sable visitors was the signal for trade. We bought a quantity of oranges, limes, coconuts, tamarinds, plantains, yams, and bananas. We likewise took in a quantity of cassada, 
a species of ground root, of which we made tolerable pudding and bread, also a few hogs and some water. We lay here several days, looking out for any English vessels that might come thither for purposes of trade. Meanwhile we began to experience the inconvenience of a hot climate. Our men were covered with blotches or boils, probably occasioned by so sudden a transition from extreme cold to extreme heat. What was worse still, we were in want of a plentiful supply of water. In consequence of this, we were placed on an allowance of two quarts per diem to each man, which occasioned us much suffering, for after preparing our puddings, bread, and grog, we had but little left to assuage our burning thirst. Some, in their distress, drank large quantities of sea-water, which only increased their thirst, and made them sick. Others sought relief in chewing lead, tea-leaves, or anything which would create moisture. Never did we feel more delighted than when our boat's crew announced the discovery of a pool of fine, clear water. While cruising along the coast, we one night perceived a large ship lying at anchor near the shore. We could not decide whether she was a large merchantman or a man of war, so we approached her with the utmost caution. Our doubts were soon removed, for she suddenly loosed all her sails and made chase after us. By the help of their glasses our officers ascertained her to be an English frigate. Of course it was folly to engage her, so we made all the sail we could carry, beat to quarters, lighted our matches, and lay down at our guns, expecting to be prisoners of war before morning. During the night we hung out false lights, and altered our course. This baffled our pursuer. In the morning she was not to be seen. The next sail we made was not so formidable. She was an English vessel at anchor in Senegal River. We approached her and hailed. Her officer returned an insolent reply, which so exasperated our captain that he passed the word to fire into her, but recalled it almost immediately. The countermand was too late, for in a moment, everything being ready for action, we poured a whole broadside into our unfortunate foe. The current carried us away from the stranger. We attempted to beat up again, but our guns had roused the garrison in a fort which commanded the river, and they began to blaze away at us in so expressive a manner that we found it prudent to get a little beyond the reach of their shot, and patiently wait for daylight. The next morning we saw our enemy hauled close in shore, under the protection of the fort, and filled with soldiers. At first it was resolved to man the boats and cut her out, but this, after weighing the subject maturely, was pronounced to be too hazardous an experiment, and notwithstanding our men begged to make the attempt, it was wisely abandoned. How many were killed by our hasty broadside we never learned, but doubtless several poor fellows were hurried to a watery and unexpected grave, affording another illustration of the beauty of war. This affair our men humorously styled the Battle of Senegal. After visiting Cape Three Points, we shaped our course for St. Thomas. On our way we lost a prize through a display of Yankee cunning in her commander. We had hoisted English colors. The officer in command of the stranger was pretty well versed in the secrets of false colors, and in return he ran up the American flag. The bait took. Supposing her to be American, we showed the stars and stripes. This was all the merchant man desired. It told him what we were, and he made all possible sail for St. Thomas. We followed, crowding every stitch of canvas our brig could carry. We also got out our sweeps and swept her along, but in vain. The merchant man was the better sailor, and succeeded in reaching St. Thomas, which, being a neutral port, secured her safety. Her name was the Jane, of Liverpool. The next morning another Liverpool merchant man got into the harbor unseen by our lookout until she was under the protection of the laws of neutrality. Our next business was to watch the mouth of the harbor in the hope of catching them as they left port. But they were too cautious to run into danger, especially as they were expecting a convoy for their protection, which might make us glad to trust more to our canvas than to our cannon. Shortly after this occurrence we made another sail standing in towards St. Thomas. Hoisting English colors, our officers also donning the British uniform, we soon came near enough to hail her. For not doubting that we were a British brig, the merchantman made no effort to escape us. Our captain hailed her, Ship ahoy! Hello! What ship is that? The ship Barton! 
where do you belong to to liverpool what is your cargo redwood palm oil and ivory where are you bound to to st thomas just at that moment our english flag was hauled down and to the inexpressible annoyance of the officers of the barton the stars and stripes supplied its place haul down your colors continued captain nicholson the old captain who up to this moment had been enjoying a comfortable nap in his very comfortable cabin now came upon deck in his shirt-sleeves rubbing his eyes and looking so exquisitely ridiculous that it was scarcely possible to avoid laughing so surprised was he at the unexpected termination of his dreams that he could not command skill enough to strike his colors which was accordingly done by the mate after taking out as much of her cargo as we desired we proceeded to set her on fire it was an imposing sight to behold the wild antics of the flames leaping from rope to rope and from spar to spar until she looked like a fiery cloud resting on the dark surface of the water presently her spars began to fall her masts went by the board her loaded guns went off the hull was burned to the water's edge and what a few hours before was a fine trim ship looking like a winged creature of the deep lay a shapeless charred mass whose blackened outline shadowed in the clear still waves looked like the grim spirit of war lurking for its prey this wanton destruction of property was in accordance with our instructions to sink burn and destroy whatever we took from the enemy such is the war spirit sink burn and destroy how it sounds yet such are the instructions given by christian nations to their agents in time of war what christian will not pray for the destruction of such a spirit the crew of the barton we carried into st thomas and placed them on board the jane excepting a portuguese and two colored men who shipped among our crew we also took with us a fine black spaniel dog whom the men called by the name of paddy this done we proceeded to watch for fresh victims on which to wreak the vengeance of the war spirit the next sail we met was an english brig called the adventure which had a whole menagerie of monkeys on board we captured and burned her just as we did the barton her crew was also disposed of in the same manner one of them an african prince who had acquired a tolerable education in england and who was remarkably polite and sensible shipped in the siren his name was samuel quaqua we now remained at st thomas several days carrying on a petty trade with the natives our men bought all kinds of fruit gold dust and birds for these things we gave them articles of clothing tobacco knives etc for an old vest I obtained a large basketful of oranges for a handful of tobacco five large coconuts a profitable exchange on my side since although i drew my tobacco of the purser i fortunately never acquired the habit of using it a loss i never regretted my coconuts were far more gratifying and valuable when we got to sea parched with thirst and suffering for water than all the tobacco in the ship from st thomas we proceeded to angola where we stayed long enough to clean paint and refit our brig from stem to stern this was the last port we intended to touch at on the coast of africa our next anchorage was to be in boston harbor at least so we proposed but the events of war frustrated our intention to accomplish our object we had to run the gauntlet through the host of english cruisers that hovered about like birds of prey along both sides of the atlantic coast this enterprise appeared so impossible to my mind while we lay at angola and the fear of being retaken and hung operated so strongly on my imagination that more than once i determined to run away and find a refuge among the africans but my better judgment prevailed and i continued at my post still i used every possible precaution to escape detection in case of our capture in accordance with the custom of our navy at that period I let my hair grow long behind. To change my looks more effectually, instead of tying mine in a queue as the others did, I let it hang in ringlets all around my face and neck. This, together with the effect of time, caused me to appear quite a different lad from what I was when a boy on board the Macedonian. I also adopted that peculiarity of dress practiced by American men-of-war's men, which consisted in wearing my shirt open at the neck with the corners thrown back. 
on these corners a device was wrought consisting of the stars of the american flag with the british flag underneath by these means i hoped to pass for a genuine yankee without suspicion in case we should fall into english hands end of chapter four